There's a lady who decided she needed to start going to church. Her life was just at a place. She's like, you know, I just need to go to church. And, and so there was one near her house. She didn't know anybody that went to church. So the one that's near her house, she just said, I'll just go there. So she got up Sunday morning. She put on a hoodie and some jeans. She walked into church, and automatically the pastor noticed that they had a visitor because, number one, they didn't have any visitors. And number two, she was not dressed appropriately for that church. I mean, she, who wears a hoodie and jeans to church? And so he was up there preaching, but he's thinking, you know, I got I to gotta talk to her. I got to kind of pull her to the side and, and kind of correct her because when you come to God's house, you got to give him your best because that's exactly what that verse meant. You got to dress up. So he pulls her to the side and he says, uh, did you enjoy church today? She goes, oh my gosh, yes, it was amazing. And he said, will you come back? And she said, yeah. He said, well, next time you come back, if, um, if you don't mind, if you just dress a little bit nicer. And she said, oh, Oh, okay, yeah, I could do that. So the next week she came back, and she had on jeans and a hoodie, but she had on a nicer hoodie and um, because that's what he asked. And as soon as she walked in, he was like, oh, man, what's wrong with this woman? I'm going to have to talk to her again. And, and because people were staring, and they were pointing, and he knew that this was going to problem. In fact, there's going probably going to be a committee meeting, and, and everybody knows those never go well. So after the service, he was like, um, did you enjoy the service? She said, absolutely. He said, you think you'll come back? She said, oh, yeah, I'm coming back next week. And he goes, um, well, let's talk about your... I mean, the way you dress, I mean, okay, you wore a nicer hoodie, but here's what I'm going to need you to do. Pray and ask God that if he were coming to this church, what would he wear? And you just, you dress like that. And she said, okay, I can do that. So the next week she walks in with the exact same hoodie and jeans on. And he walks up to her and he says, ma'am, I thought I told you to ask God what he would wear. And she said, oh, I, I, I did. And the pastor said, you did? What did he say? And God said, he didn't know. He's never been to this church. Um, and so I thought that was, <laughs> thought it was an appropriate way to start because at the end of the day, all of us in that story, all of us have been in that story. All of, the, all of us, everybody in this room, knows what it's like to be judged. You've been judged. You have. You, if you went through middle school, you got judged. If you've been in any church environment for any amount of time, you've been judged. Everybody here in this room or watching online knows what it's like to be judged by someone or a group of someone's, and it's not fun. Nobody loves to be judged, but we've all been judged. On the flip side, all of us have judged somebody else. And don't pretend like, uh-uh, my halo. I mean, I, no, no, no. All of, I judged somebody just yesterday. Yesterday, I'm in my car, I'm driving down the road, I look to my right, there's a lady in the car with the windows rolled up by herself with a mask on. Now, I'm magnostic, okay? Like, I don't care about masks, okay? I, if you want to wear one, wear one. If you don't want to wear one, but when you're by yourself in the car, come on! I, I, ju- I, I did. I judged her, and I confess it. I'm not perfect. And all of us know what it's like to judge, and all, all of us know what it's like to be judged. But at the end of the day, one of the things I want to do is create a church. We talked about this a couple weeks ago. I want to create a church where people can experience the presence of Jesus because over time, if we experience the presence of Jesus, we can't stay the way we are. He always changes people in his time, not our time. So with that in mind, I thought that today would be the perfect day where I could set up three promises that I'm going to make you as the pastor of this church. And these three things that I'm going to promise you today are are true, and they're always going to be true as long as I'm the pastor. These three things, these three promises I'm going to make today are always going to be true of Second Chance Church as long as, I'm, as long as I remain pastor. Now, I want to set it up by going to the Gospel of Luke. In Luke chapter 15, if you're familiar with church um, or if you're familiar with the Bible at all, Luke 15 is where Jesus tells three parables in a row that all have to do with the same subject. It's the only time in the scriptures he ever does that. Only time he tells three parables in a row that have to do with the same subject. It's the parable of the lost sheep, the parable of the lost coin, and the parable of the lost or the prodigal son. In every story, something is lost. Um, it's searched for or it, or it realizes it's lost, and then it's found, and there's a celebration. Every story. But something, something prompted Jesus to kind of go off and tell these stories. Something, there was something in him that made him go there. And it's out of these verses that I want to preach out of today. And it's out of these verses that um, I'm going to make the three promises for our church today. Here we go. Luke chapter 15, verse 1, starts out like this. Tax collectors. Now, some of you are like, well, is that the whole verse? No, 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 there's more. But that's, that's, that's what I want to focus on. Is there somebody in your life or a group of somebody's or a certain type of person 
that gives you like the heebie-jeebies, like the like they, they just give you the creeps. I mean, don't point, but but, but like they, these people, like when you see somebody like this, you're just like, yeah, like. Like for me, it, like it's clowns. Like I, there's something wrong with a clown. The clowns ain't right. Clowns ain't, ain't right. Somebody like, I dress up like a clown. Well, you, something's wrong with you, okay? I'm judging you right now. <laughs> Karis and Shannon last night wanted to watch It. No. Uh-uh. I bought It on myself, all right? Because I, I just watched the preview, and I was like, no, we're not watching It. So, so think about this for a second. The tax collectors. Now, we don't have a modern-day equivalent in our society, but 2,000 years ago, these were the most reprehensible people on the planet. Like to a Jewish person, it didn't get any worse than a tax collector. A tax collector had basically turned their back on the Jewish nation, on the nation of Israel, and they had turned their back on God. And they had essentially sold their soul to the Roman Empire so they could make money by, by gouging people, price gouging people over and over and over again. These people were not welcomed at the temple and they were highly judged by the religious elite in that society. Tax collectors were essentially the walking damned. Tax collectors. And that's what Luke starts with. Does it get better? Oh yeah, it gets way better. Watch this. Tax collectors and other notorious sinners. Now I love that. I do. Not just sinners. Like, notorious sinners. Like, if you're going to do it, do it right. Like, like don't just play it. Just, just go all in. And for me, that, I mean, that's, I'm, in, I'm in that group. I'm a notorious sinner. That's who I am. Some of y'all are like, no, you're not. Google me. All right? So, I, and, by the way, let me pause because somebody always does this. Somebody else is like, you got to quit talking about that. No, I don't. Because it's my story. And God brought me through that. And I'm always going to celebrate that. So, so I'll always make a reminder that maybe makes me uncomfortable. Well, just stick around. I'll make you way more uncomfortable than that, all right? But notorious sinners, in other words, these are notorious sinners are people that are known for their sin. So, so for example, hypothetically, this would be the girl that got pregnant when she was 16 years old. This would be the, the guy that got caught looking at porn or the or the the, the, the guy that got a divorce or the, the guy that his marriage blew up or th this would be the addict, the, 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 the person that's known for their sin. By the way, tax collectors and notorious sinners were not welcome at the temple. They could not go to the temple. They could not be, be prayed for. They could not have a relationship with God. Their sins could not be forgiven. These people... Tax collectors and notorious sinners, don't miss this, they were rejected by religion. Rejected by religion. So, Luke, <laughs> what do you have to say about tax, tax collectors and other notorious sinners are horrible people? That's what you're going to say, right, Luke? We know what you're saying. Take us there, Luke. Take us where we're going. And he says, tax collectors and other notorious sinners often came to listen to Jesus teach. What? Wait a minute. Hold on. Hold on. Jesus let those people in his church? The, Jesus, come here, come here, come here. Do you not know what he does for a living? Do you not know what she, Jesus This right here reminds me of a, a phrase somebody else came, came up with. It. I didn't come up with it, but I've said it several times. People that were nothing like Jesus liked Jesus. And Jesus liked people that were nothing like him. And these people were rejected by religion, but always welcome with Jesus. That's the kind of church we're always going to be. We're, if you felt, I, I, I just want, and I'll get to more of that in just a second. So tax collectors and other notorious sinners often came to listen to, so, so that they couldn't go to the temple, they were rejected by the temple, but they could come to Jesus. Isn't that great? We just skip all the goats and the, and the blood and all that stuff. We just go straight to Jesus, all right? Now, verse 2. This made the Pharisees and teachers of religious law complain. Pause. 
Religious people always complain. Church people always complain. I've been working at church for 30 years. People going to complain about everything. You could baptize 482 people. 90, 99% of people are celebrating, and there's 1% of people going, who's going to pay the water bill for all them baptisms? Like there's somebody that's always going to complain about something. Always, 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 always. So, and, and, and they drive us crazy. And, and you got some people going, oh, but they're a part of the body of Christ. Yeah, but they're the, the appendix. If they bust, we all die. So we got we to gotta figure out how to contain that, all right? So... So Jesus said, that our, our, um, Luke tells us this made them complain that he was associating with such sinful people. In other words, they're going, I can't believe you associate with sinful people as if they weren't sinful people themselves. And this, is, this takes the cake. And even eating with them. Now, in Israel today, but especially 2,000 years ago, eating it is not something you do. It's an event. It's, a, it's like a two or three hour thing. They bring in several courses. And when you sat down in Jesus' time to eat with somebody, when you sat at a table to eat with them, it was essentially saying, I'm accepting you. Like for me, eating, eating is just something you do. Like I went out to eat a couple of weeks ago with some people. Two of them I didn't even know. We we're just kind of there. And we all sat down. And as soon as we sat down and the waitress got our drink orders, they were like, so Perry, I was going to ask you. I said, time out. So time out. Look at your menu. Look at your menu right now, both of y'all. I didn't know them. I said, look at your menu. They looked at me. I said, no, 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 look at your menu because when she comes back, you've got to be ready to order. <laughs> I'm going to suggest three things. These are three things I've had. If you want these three things, you can get one of those three things. If you don't, but like, listen, she's going to ask you about your sides. You get two sides. The sides are at the bottom left because I hate it when people are like, I, like the, I want the chicken sandwich. You get two sides with that. Oh, I do? Yes, you do. It says it right there in the description. Where are the sides? They're at the bottom right-hand side of the menu, you idiot. I'm saying this in my mind. I actually might have said it out loud. I don't know. But, but for, so for me, eating is like, let's go, let's go, let's go, let's go. But for Jesus, in Jesus' time, it was like, let's sit down. Let's enjoy our company. And when you ate with someone, it was basically saying, yeah, we, these are my people. These are my people. And the religious people are looking at Jesus going, you're associate, whoa, you're eating with people? Which, which leads, all this right here leads to three promises that I want to make to our church that are always going to be true. Here we go. Number one, we will be a church where everyone is welcomed, but not everyone is comfortable. We'll be a church where everyone's welcome, but it's not, not, not everyone it's comfortable. I got invited to some people's house when, and to, for dinner, and I went one. I never will forget this. I was very welcomed in this home. And, and we go in, and they, I mean, they could cook. It was like a couple. They, and they cooked this incredible meal. I sit down to eat with them, and uh, they had three kids at the table. So it was me and three kids and the mom and dad. <laughs> and and uh, I just asked them. I'm trying to make small talk. And I said, uh, so how long have y'all been married? And they said, they said, 10 years. And it got quiet for just a second, and the oldest kid said, Dad, I'm 12. <laughs> I was welcome. I was not comfortable. Because <laughs> the parents looked at me. They looked at me, and I was like, I didn't do it. I mean, y'all did it. I mean, I guess y'all did it. I don't know. Like, y'all have some talking to do. Pass the broccoli. Like, I, I was... Super welcome, but super uncomfortable. Now, there will always be things about our church that makes you uncomfortable. If you're religious today, you're uncomfortable with the fact that I'm wearing a hat. It's too bad. Like, there's things that are always going to, like, like, every once in a while, we're going to throw in a song that, that's not on the Christian charts. And it'll make, it'll make people feel uncomfortable. And, and that's fine. But then other times people are going to feel uncomfortable because, like, when the Holy Spirit moves and convicts us, have you ever had one of those moments in church, I've had them, I've had them where you're like, <laughs> oh, snap. Like, that just got personal. That just got personal. But at the end of the day, the reason most people are going to be uncomfortable because, is because my heart is for the people that were attracted to Jesus. Because, and, I, I, and I, I'm not just going to say this, I wanted us to see it too. Because if we're not attracting the same people Jesus was attracting, then we're not preaching the same message Jesus was preaching. 
See, the, the Pharisees and the teachers of the law, they had a message, do more, try harder. Jesus' message was, it is finished. Completely different messages. And at the end of the day, I, cause I, and the reason I want to put this out there is because I have people just about every week going, do you know you have so-and-so coming to your church? Yep, I'm so glad they're there every week. And this is where people go, well, this is what's weird. Period. Anybody can come to your church and they can just go live how they want to during the week and come back and live how they want to during the week and come back and live how they want to in the week and come back. Well, two things. Number one, I would rather have them do that than go hide it for years and pretend to be perfect and then come back. Second of all, yes, that's what happens. And I'm glad they do it because I believe that we're creating environments where people can experience the presence of Jesus on a weekly basis. And I believe with all my heart that as we experience the presence of Jesus, that he will change us in his time, not our time, because I don't believe we can meet Jesus, hang out with him, and stay the same. Amen. So that, that's why I believe that conviction is greater than condemnation. I, like sometimes we're going to get uncomfortable in church and it's going to be conviction. You know how I know this? Because every week I get a text, an email, or a phone call. And they, sit and it all, they all say the same thing. Today, I felt like you were preaching to me. That's, I wasn't. Like most of you, I didn't even know you were going to be here. I knew the staff were going to be here, but we pay them to be here, all right? I mean, uh, they're here every week. Yeah, we pay them. Um, so we're like, can you pay me to come to church? I, I don't, we gave free hats at 830 this morning. Y'all should have been here. We got them for sale next week, though. Y'all like these hats? Y'all think that's cool? Yeah. I like it, too. Conviction is greater than condemnation. See, I can stand on stage every week and call it... I, I, I call it a drive-by guilting. You know what that is? It's like I just take guilt and I go, <laughs> and I just do a drive-by. I just guilt everybody. You know how effective that is long-term? It's not effective. That's, this is why people leave church. It's because you got condemned. You got judged. You got their, your, somebody pointed their finger at you. But conviction, when the Holy Spirit puts his finger on something in our lives and says, we need to deal with this, I always want that. Because that brings about the kind of change that we need to see. Which leads to promise number two. Promise number two is this. We will value you more than a view. We will value you more than a view. Because how many of you know that you can have different views on things and still love somebody? Only half the people raise their hand, all right? Yeah. For me, like for example, for me, if you said, hey, Perry, can we make a target run after the service? The answer is yes. You know why? Because to me, a target run takes five minutes. Doesn't matter what you want to get in target, I can get it in five minutes or less. Guaranteed. Yeah. I'm like a caveman. I leave the cave, I kill it, I bring it back, we eat it. That's what I do. That's how I roll in target, okay? That's my view on a target run. Shannon, my fiance, different view on target. But I didn't know that until recently. After a dinner date, she said, would you mind if we made a target run? I said, absolutely not. Because in my mind, I'm thinking five minutes or less. We can get in, we get out. Uh-uh. <laughs> it's not how she does target. Like, we walk in, we walk. Because I said, what are we going to get? Because I needed to identify what we needed to go kill. So she said, we're going to get a birthday present for her nephew. I'm like, easy. We're on our way to the birthday present. She's like, oh, we got to stop at the cards. I said, you didn't say anything about a card. <laughs> She said, well, you got to get a card with a birthday present. I'm like, no, you don't. She said, yes, you do. So I compromised, and we did. Um, and so, so then, she has to, then she has to read the cards. Like she's read, I'm like, why? You don't have to read. Just get that one. She said, what if it says something untrue? I said, you scratch it out. You just, it just looks pretty. <laughs> then we had to walk by the, through the shoe section. If you've ever been shopping with a woman and you walk through the shoe, I mean, so anyway, the, never, and so we finally made it back to the presents. And she got this present, and she got this present. She got, I was like, why do we have three presents? Well, i got to get one for the other kid because the other kid's going to be there, and I don't want the other kid to feel bad. I was like, I could care less about the other kid's feelings. So anyway, I didn't, I didn't say it out loud. I just said it myself. So I'm, I'm, I'm holding these presents. How many of you guys know that she's picking out presents? You're holding it all. We, we didn't get one of the little baskets because you know why? We were just getting one thing. <laughs> then we went to the gift bag section. I didn't know there was a gift bag section in Target. 
And then she had to take all the stuff out of my hands and put it in the gift bag. And she said, do you think that's cute? I'm like, we've been here for 45 minutes. And, like, I didn't know, like, by the way, if we're buying you a present, you want Shannon to do it. You don't want me to do it because I just go get it and just bring it to you. Um, it, we have different views on a target run. There are different people in this room that have different views. When you say a certain thing, like politics, see, right there, I got everybody, all kinds of different views. It's amazing to me. Let me just say this. This is a side note. It's amazing to me the number of friendships that have been ended over Donald Trump and Joe Biden. The number of people that won't talk. Guys, guys, it's ridiculous. In 100 years, nobody will remember their name. So quit selling your soul out to a party or a person when there's a man named Jesus that cares way more about your soul than anybody in Washington, D.C. I'm an equal opportunity offender. I said both candidates, all right? But, but there, there are people here today in this room, and you're back in church, or maybe you're watching online and you haven't came back to church yet, because somebody valued a view more than you. And you saw the way they treated your gay brother or your divorced mother. And that's the reason you walked away. Nobody I've ever met that's walked away from church walked away because of Jesus. They walked away because people loved a view more than them. Let me show you. And I didn't see this until I was preparing for this message this week. I've never seen it this way. But let me, let me break it down in a way that was easy for me to understand. The Pharisees and the teachers of the law, they saw tax collectors. Jesus saw Matthew. If Jesus would have put Matthew in the category of tax collectors, we wouldn't know the apostle Matthew. But while the Pharisees and the teachers of the law are judging Matthew for collecting taxes, Jesus is walking up to him going, hey, Matthew, follow me. If you read the account in Matthew chapter 9, it's fascinating because Jesus didn't even say, stop it. This is the, he was doing the most simple act in the nation, and Jesus didn't even ask him to stop. Jesus said, hey, Matthew, just like you are right now, follow me. And we don't know when Matthew stopped collecting taxes. We just know when he started following Jesus. And we know by the time we get to the, gospel, to, to the book of Acts, Matthew's not come collecting taxes anymore. He's a fully devoted follower of Christ. You know why? Because Jesus valued him more than his view. Could Jesus have walked up to Matthew and said, you're wrong? Absolutely. But Jesus valued relationships over winning arguments. The Pharisees and teachers of the law saw notorious sinners. Jesus saw Mary. Now, there's a lot of Marys, and so let me explain. Because there's like, it's like in the New Testament, like Mary was like every third girl's name. It's like Mary, Mary, Mary. So, so this is the Mary, though, in, in the New Testament that, that um, she got around. You know what I'm talking about? Like everybody knew Mary. There was nothing private about Mary's life. Nothing. Am, am I making myself clear or do I need to go further? Am I clear? She, she was a hoe, all right? I mean, it's, we got it. Jesus, Jesus didn't walk up and go, hey, ho, hey, ho, hip hop. He got, now, he could have. He didn't call her by her sin. He called her by her name. That's what he does. So, so while other people are judging the notorious sinner, Jesus calls her by her name. And by the end of the Gospels and the beginning of Acts, she's a fully devoted follower of Jesus because he loved her more than being right. Jesus could have walked around and told everybody, you're wrong, you're wrong, you're wrong, you're wrong, you're wrong. Instead, Jesus said, you know what? Just follow me just, just as you are because Jesus loves us exactly where we are, but he loves us too much to let us stay that way. See, the problem with the Pharisees is the Pharisees were biblical, but they were not relational. The Pharisees Walked around all the time, and they were proud of the fact that they were right. 
And they were so right that they actually pushed people away rather than drawing them in. Now, don't get me wrong. When it comes to convictions, I've got strong convictions. Religious convictions, political convictions. I, listen, I have never not had an opinion. But I, I value people way over my opinion. See, the Pharisees, this is how messed up it gets. And I preached on this several months ago, but there was a guy that went to the synagogue, and he had a deformed hand. In fact, the Bible says his right hand was deformed. And he probably had to hide it because you weren't accepted in religious circles if you had a deformity. So he's hiding his hand, and he gets called out. Now watch how crazy this gets. Watch how crazy and insane religion is. Here we go. And Luke told us in Luke chapter 6, verse 6 and 7, On another Sabbath day, a man with a deformed right hand was in the synagogue while Jesus was teaching. The teachers of the religious law and the Pharisees watched Jesus closely. They're watching Jesus. How, how godly do you have to be to spy on Jesus? Why are they watching him closely? If he healed the man's hand, they planned to celebrate. It's not what it says, is it? If he healed the man, they planned to what? What's this word say right, right here on three? One, two, three? Accuse, accuse, accuse. Accuse, accuser, accuser. Who in the scriptures is known as the accuser? Satan. Satan is the accuser. Religion accuses. Satan and religion hold hands. But Satan is seeking to accuse. Jesus is seeking to defend. So, so if he heals the man's hand, they plan to accuse him of working on the Sabbath. Now, that's not breaking a command. But what the Pharisees do, and I don't know if you've ever been around these people, is they make up like, okay, this is the law. So this is the law that we make so you don't even get to the law. For example, when I was growing up as a kid, couldn't say darn. Couldn't say darn in my house. Couldn't say darn at the Christian school. Because darn was too close to Damn, okay, some of y'all whispered it, damn. No, darn was too close to damn. So as soon as you say darn, next thing you know, you're saying damn and you're killing people. All right, that, that's how the progression goes. And so darn was, just, people tell me, darn is just as bad. No, it's not. I've had people say, well, you can't say damn. I'm 49 years old. I say anything I want. Y'all wait till I get 50. But I'm 49 years old. I say anything I want. But you make up extra rules, and that's what the Pharisees did. And so they made up so many rules that they were finding sin, and I put that in air quotes, in Jesus' life. It's a crazy place to be. Third promise is this. We will never forget all of us fall desperately short and desperately need the grace of God. Starting right here with this guy right here. You, you will never walk in this church and... Hopefully, you never feel like I'm pointing my finger. I'm, I'm not. I'm not. I'm not. Because listen, I, I, am the, I am the chief of sinners, all right? I have messed up more times than I have. I, I've, I've gotten it wrong way more than I've gotten it right. I, in fact, this week I had a root canal. I don't know if you've ever had one of those. They're so much fun. God, you should sign up for one. They're amazing. <laughs> First of all, I had to pay for what they did to me. But they numb, they numb, like I couldn't feel this side of my face. And, and then and he's got a drill in there, and he's drilling. And I'm like, he's drilling in my mouth right now. And then I saw smoke. I, I watched smoke coming out of my mouth. And then I smelled like burning. And I was like, what the? Mm. But you know why I got there? Because I was stupid. You know how I was stupid? Because the other day I got a cliff bar. I, got, I, I eat a cliff bar every morning. I got my cliff bar out. And I eat my cliff bar. And I'm chewing. And have you ever chewed and you chewed so, that you bit down on some, something so hard your entire head shook? I bit down on something my entire head shook. I was like, mm, and I spit out a tooth. And I got mad at cliff bar. Because in my mind, this is what happened. A cliff bar employee was like mixing up the cliff bar stuff. And as he or she is mixing up the clip bar stuff, their tooth fell out. And they're like, nothing to see here. And they put it in the package that I got. So I'm eating. I, and can you, how gross is that? You got somebody else's tooth in your mouth? Like, oh, my gosh. So I made an Instagram video. No, I took it down. But I made an Instagram video. I called out Cliff Bar. I was like, hey, Cliff Bar. I held up the tooth. I was like, y'all got teeth in your products, and your products are good, but they're not this good. And, I, and in my mind, I was thinking about, you know, I, I, was, I was like, this is so messed up. And then this is how I ended the video, because I got all my teeth. Then I thought, I should check. 
I, t- <laughs> I took my tongue and ran it across the bottom of my teeth. I was like, oh, so there's a gap right here big enough to drop a Cadillac through. Like, I, it, was, it was unreal. So I took the video down. But isn't it funny how, how quick we can be judgmental? And all of a sudden, we're like, oh, snap. Like, when people walk in this church, I mean, <laughs> and they say, man, I messed up. I'm like, yeah, me too. Me too. And I want this to be a place where we never forget that all of us fall desperately short and desperately need the grace of God. Because here's reality. Here's reality. Some of you are like, yes, and amen, because I've been there. I've made some bad decisions. Here's the reality. The worst decision of your life is quite possibly still ahead of you. If you'd have told me that when I was 40, I'd have called you crazy. But I'm 49, and I know it's true. So I used this chart a few weeks ago. Y'all remember this chart? We, we talked about this. If you weren't here, let me just real quick review. This is like our life before we come to Christ. This is how we meet Christ. It doesn't mean we have zero value. It means Jesus zeroes out our past and gives us a brand new future. And this is how we feel in regards to how close we are in walking with Jesus. So we said a negative four is somebody who will come into church and they walk into church and they're not going to live like a Christian. They're going to be who they are, but at least they're coming to church and we're going to celebrate them coming to church. But a negative four can go to a zero and this, we want this to be a place where people can meet Christ and, and become brand new people. And then we said that people get stalled out like twos. We want to see twos go to five. And we said that this type of growth usually happens underground. It's like you put the seed underground and it begins to grow and you don't really see it. This is why some people look at other people and go, I don't see any fruit in your life. That doesn't mean that God's not working. It just means that we can't see the actual space that God is working. And so, so some people go from a two to a five. And then we said this is going to be a place where some people, sometimes you go backwards in your walk with Christ. You make bad decisions and you go from a seven to a three, but it's a safe place where you can raise your hand and say, I need some help. I've made some bad decisions. I'm in trouble. And then hopefully over time you go back from a three to an eight. We want to see this type of growth. And we said that no matter where you are on this chart, um, and, 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 I challenge everybody every time we do this to find where you are on this chart. Like, you're not quite close to Jesus. You're maybe really close. You haven't made that decision yet. You've stalled out, but you want to grow in your relationship with Christ. You've never been this close to Christ. The only problem with presenting something like this is if you're not careful, people who feel like they're right here will judge this person for not being this far along. And these people judge these people. And these people judge these people. And all these people judge all these people. And we, we don't understand that all the people on that chart, all of us, fall desperately short and need the grace of God. Because this is how we feel in regards to how close we are to Jesus. But what we don't understand is when it comes to our walk with Jesus, the relationship is not horizontal, it's vertical. And all of us are the same distance away from the grace of God. So in other words, the same grace it takes to save this person is the same grace it takes to sustain this person. See, this person right here will say, well, I get up every morning and read my Bible for an hour. That's great. Where did you get that discipline? Because you didn't have it before you met Christ. Could it be that God's grace gave you the discipline to actually do that? So every single person in this room has fallen fallen desperately short. And all of us desperately need the grace of God. Two weeks, we move in this new facility. And uh, it's, it's, listen, we went as basic as possible. But there are a couple things I picked out that I wanted specifically, and I wanted them specifically for everybody who attends this church. So in two weeks, you're going to walk into the doors of a brand new sanctuary. And no matter what doors you walk in to the sanctuary, We've got, we've got a Bible verse written over these doors that's going to be true for as long as I'm the pastor of this church. We're all going to walk under the promise, fear not, you will no longer live in shame. Don't be afraid. There's no more disgrace for you. That's the church that I want to be a part of for the rest of my life, where Jesus, where Jesus loves us as we are, but he also loves us too much to let us stay that way.
We stand for prayer. Jesus, thank you so much. God, for the work that you've done in this place over these past two years. It's been phenomenal, but we know it's just the beginning. God, I pray for every single person in this room. God, that knows that we know we've got to take a next step. That your Holy Spirit has convicted us in regards to what we need to start doing or stop doing. And God, we know it's your voice. Father, I pray that over these next few moments that we would have a posture of surrender, that our hearts and our minds would be completely open to the work that you want to do. Because you do, Jesus, you love us just as we are. But you love us too much to let us stay that way. So Father, may we, may we walk in surrender and say, have your way in me, Lord. Your will be done. Jesus, thank you so much for what you've done in our church and what you're doing in our lives. Father, I pray that everyone in this room would have a heart that is wide open to you. And with heads bowed and eyes closed right now, that decision that Jesus is pressing into you, that thing you know you need to do, why don't you just go ahead and say yes to him right now? Yes, Lord, I'll take that step. Yes, Lord, I'll do that thing. Yes, Lord, I will follow you. And maybe you're here today and you've never prayed to receive Christ. You've never asked Jesus to come into your life. You've never turned your life over to him. And you know that's the decision you need to make today, whether you're in this room or watching online. If that's you, then I want you right where you stand to pray right now in your heart. Just pray this in your heart. Just say, Dear Lord Jesus, I know that I'm a sinner and I, I need you as my Savior. I believe you died on the cross and rose from the grave to pay for my sin. And right now, Jesus, I receive you into my life. Be my Lord. In Jesus' name. With heads bowed and eyes closed, if you just prayed that prayer, if you just prayed that prayer in your heart, would you hold up your hand just for a second and hold it up high? I want to celebrate with you. I want to pray for you. If you're online, do the hand raise emoji because we want to pray with you and pray for you. Jesus, thank you so much. Today, as in every Sunday, you have saved people. Thank you so much, Jesus, that you spoke to so many of us so clearly today. Thank you so much, Jesus, for your conviction because you draw us closer to you. Thank you so much for loving us as we are, but loving us too much to let us stay that way. Thank you, Jesus, for your mercy and your grace. Fill each one of us with the wisdom and the courage and the faith we need to follow through for what you've called us to do. We love you, Jesus. We ask this in your name. Everybody that agreed said amen. Are you glad you came to church today? Hey, we got one more Sunday in this place. We'll see you next week. Don't miss it. It's going to be the best one yet. Love you guys. God bless.